Yeah, I guess uh, the, the rest uh, thought that the, this class is permanently locked. So recall that uh, what we did is we defined uh, positive variation And positive variation is p of x equal to 1 half vx plus f of x minus f of a. We have negative variation. That's one half Vx minus f of x plus f of a. And what we have is, as a consequence, uh, we see that one V of x is equal to positive plus negative variation, two that f of x is equal to positive variation minus negative variation plus f of a. And these are special. So we know that uh, both p and n are increasing functions. We know that What's special about them is that if f is a function of bounded variation on a, b, but, and by the way, plus the functions, uh, the increasing functions, and we know that p is bigger than 0, n is bigger than 0. And if f is a function of bounded variation, then f can be written as some function g minus h, where g and h are increasing. So that what, it, what it implies is that we will find that the variation from x to y of p is less than or equal to the variation from x to y of g. And the variation from x to y of n will be less than or equal to the variation x to y of h. So that's what makes them, uh, what makes p and n in essence uh, uh, so special is that they are like the two increasing functions that are less steeply, uh, basically their variation is, is, uh, is most controlled, it's minimal. Next, observe that since we have that f minus f of a is p minus n, it follows 
that the variation of f, which is equal to the variation of f minus f of a, variation is not changed if we add a scalar, right? Because adding a scalar, it just takes this function, uh, lifts it up or down, but really variation is just uh, the total distance traveled. It just starts at f of a here. And now this is less than or equal to, well, this is equal to variation from a to b of p minus n, which by triangle inequality is less than or equal to the variation of p plus the variation n. Now those are increasing functions. So that is p of b minus p of a plus n of b minus n of a. And then notice that what's p of a? p of a is, plug here a, this v is 0, right? From a variation from a to a is 0, and then this is subtracted to 0. So p of a is just 0. Similarly, n of a is 0. So this is simply p of b plus n of b, which is from this formula p plus n is v. So this is just v of b, which is the total variation of f. Hence, the variation from a to b of f exactly equals to the positive variation plus the negative variation. So the implication is if I take the bounded variation norm, this by definition is f of a plus variation from a to b of f, which is equal to f of a plus p of b plus n of b. Make sense? That's really, in essence, I mean, there's a lot of talk, but really it's this, right? It's really this. And the fact that those functions are 0 at a. So with this calculation, we have this proposition is that if I have a product of two functions of bounded variation, we have less than or equal, this is less than or equal to the product of the norms. A kind of Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Now, the proof of that so we have that F1 is the positive variation minus the negative variation plus 
f1 of a, f2 is the positive variation minus the negative variation plus f2 of a. And we have that the variation for F1 is just P1B plus N1B plus absolute value of F1 of A. The same goes for F2, so that would be P2B plus N2 of B plus the root value F2 of A. So then you just calculate what's F1 times F2. It is the product of, uh, of this triple sum and this triple sum, so it will have nine elements. And that would be P1, P2, plus N1, N2, plus F1A, P2, plus F2A, P1, minus N1, P2, minus N2, P1, minus F1, A, N2, minus F2, A times N1, and plus the product F1, A, F2, A. So in this product, everything say for the very last term is monotonically increasing. It's a product of increasing functions. Well, if you remove the negative, right? Each, each, this term, this term, this term, this term, this term, all those terms are monotonically increasing and at A they vanish. So what we have is F1, F2, VV, variation from A to B, F1, F2, plus absolute value F1A, absolute value F2A, now because this product F1, F2 is equal to this long thing, so uh, we can apply the, uh, the inequality here. So that would be less than or equal to this variation. Uh, you can just subtract this term. It's constant. So uh, it's less than or equal to just N1. So variation from A, B, and uh, P1, P2, plus all the way to variation from A to B, F of 2 of A, and 1 plus the variation of this term is just 0, so plus the absolute value F1 A, F2 A. And that's equal to P1 B, P2 B, etc. all of it at B, all the way to F1 A, F2 A, 
And by looking at it carefully, you see that it factors. So you would have nine terms, and it would factor into P1B plus and one b plus F1A, absolute value, times P2B, 2B plus absolute value F2 of A, which are the norms of F1 and F2. All right, so this is just a calculation. So the next uh, topic, the final topic in this chapter is Halley's theorem. So first is, uh, we actually already spoke about this in one of the proofs, Halley's Selection principle. So let Fn be a sequence. functions where Fn is acting from some space X into R and such that the sup norm of Fn is less than or equal to some bound K. So it's uniformly bounded. Let D be any countable subset of X then there is a subsequence of Fn let's call it Fn sub k such that limit as k goes to infinity of F sub n k of x exists for any x belonging to D. So we already saw this proof, but let me repeat it. So the only difficulty is just uh, um, labeling the sequences. So we have that D is the set X, let's say XJ, where J is bigger than or equal to one. So it's a countable set. So then what I can do is for the point x1, I can produce a sequence which I label 
f1, 1, f1, 2, f1, 3, f1, 4. And uh, what's special about the sequence is that it converges at x1. Make sense? So this is a sequence. So uh, what, what I mean is pick sequence or subsequence. F one N of F sub N such that F one N of X one goes to something or converges. Make sense? Now, so that we are not, not completely dead, I'm talking about, uh, about it with this voice. So how do I know that this sequence exists? So how can I know that there is a subsequence, I just labeled it weirdly, uh, that will converge at x1? I just said, oh, pick a sequence that converges at x1. How do I know one exists? Yeah, so it's uh, so it's uniformly bounded, and what does it mean? Must exist a sequence that converges to that. Right. So how so how so absolutely bounded? That's all we know. We don't know anything about about those functions except that they are absolutely bounded. So uh, then, if I look at the sequence. F n of x1. In particular, I just take the absolute value here. At this value, it's bounded. At another value x, it's going to be bounded by the same k. But, but it means that we have a bounded sequence. Now, every bounded sequence has, uh, um, every bounded sequence is what? It's totally bounded. And therefore, has a, um, it has a Cauchy sequence, Cauchy subsequence, right? So that means that Fn of x1, where n is bounded, which implies totally bounded, which implies some subsequence converges. Okay. Is this part of the all stars stars theorem? Or is that compact? Oh, it's not the more general. Now, what, what are we, well, Bolzano-Weierstrass, yes, if, if the sequence is infinite, why not? Yes. If you mean Bolzano-Weierstrass, you can apply that here, right? Every infinite set that is bounded has uh, a limit point, right? So we are using some, we are using whatever, whatever version you like, right? It just if you, in the real numbers, if you find a bounded sequence, it must have a conversion subsequence. That's not obvious, right? It's obvious only once you develop a lot of machinery. That's because uh, R is complete and, and uh, because every bounded set is totally bounded. So you can use that tools to create a sequence. Good. So, sorry. Please. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so the f sub one prime, uh, comma n, it's like a repeat f one. I mean, I, I no, no, no. This is weird, uh, weird notation. I don't know how to write it otherwise, because we're going to pick subsequences of subsequences of subsequences, right? Okay. So, so instead of uh, uh, so, so here what what we do, right? So, so some subsequence converges. Uh, suppose it is. Suppose it is uh, f 
fn of k, right? That's the, the subsequence, fn of k, and we are just going to write fn of k as f1k. Okay? So 1 is the first subsequence we picked, and uh, it reminds us that we picked it so that it converges uh, for the point x1, and this indicates uh, going in the limit further in the sequence, right? So this is, uh, I don't know what, what, 1, 1 refers to the integer uh, n of 1, the, the first integer that I pick in that sequence, second integer that I pick in that sequence, etc. Make sense? Yeah. It, the notation is the only thing that makes it difficult. I don't know, the notation is, the idea is very simple. Okay? So then, this converges. Now I uh, do the same thing for x2. So I have now f2, 1, f2, 2, f2, 3, f2, 4. Now, what is this? Where did I pick this uh, subsequence? From where? It's from the indices used in the previous subsequence. In the previous, exactly, right? So. So this is a subsequence of the previous subsequence. Now the reason we do that is now f2, 1, f2, 2, f2, 3 is both convergent at x2 and convergent at x1. Make sense? Do you assume x1 doesn't equal? Oh, oh never mind. Uh, yes, they are, they, are, they are not equal because uh, they are just listings of d, right? It's enumeration of d. I mean, do, do you assume that it converges to a different point? I don't know. It just converges. Uh, that depends on the functions uh, and depends uh, even on the choice, right? And maybe I pick another sequence, it will be converging to something else. There might be many limits. So it makes sense? And uh, what we have is when we go from here to here, this is sub sequence. Right? And then I do the same thing for x3. And then this would be f31, f32, f33, f34. Also converges. And again, this is. Subsequence, right, of the previous subsequence. We take subsequences of subsequences. And we continue to do that on We continue doing this. Now, how do I pick the the final subsequence? So you say, well, well, each layer. So at the fourth layer, this subsequence converges at x4, at x3, at x2, and at x1. Now, how do I ensure that uh, that I am picking a subsequence that converges uh, that converges for all those values? Uh, you see, so so uh, so you might just uh, might say just just this algorithm doesn't ever terminate. So again, algorithmically that makes no sense. But um, well, what you have is uh, as you as you you might imagine if you go down to the infinite row, then you have this uh, function that converges for all x1, x2, x3, x4. But the problem is as you are picking subsequences, you might be depleting all the integers, right? So you, maybe nothing is left, right? So uh, uh, that's one problem, of course, right? I mean, uh, you might uh, actually have an issue with the entire construction of the argument, right? You can't just infinitely choose subsequences? Uh, well, you, you see, that then you know, that there is a problem. I mean, how do you phrase this? Is because if you choose infinitely subsequences, you never arrive at, uh, at, uh, the, at the final subsequence that we're seeking that converges at all the xn. Right. 
right? So I mean, the way you, you think of it, I suppose, is so there exists this uh, this this sequence, and for each right away, we already right away have all all of those rows are generated, right? All those subsequences are generated. They are automatic. They're not kind of I don't wait to generate first and second. And they're just automatically they're all there, right? And uh, the thing is. How do I know that, uh, how do I, I mean, I cannot just pick, uh, there is no final row to pick to begin with, right? There is, it has infinitely many rows. So then uh, how, do you de how do you decide on a subsequence that converges at all the elements? So what you do is, it's this di diagonalization argument. You take the first function. Then you take this, then you take this. That's why it's called uh, counter diagonalization argument, right? So you, you're, you're, you're creating this sequence like this. So let Fn sub k be equal to Fk k. This sequence converges on D. You believe me? Well, do we still have the philosophical issue of generating mm -hmm. infinitely many subsequences? Yes, that's a, that's a major philosophical issue. So the, the idea is the idea is that those subsequences they just exist. I don't know how you, you I mean when you are trying to list the first row you will never be ever done, right? Listing the second row you will never ever be done. So what you imagine is that they just exist, right? So all the subsequences of uh, this, fa this family of functions of n they already exist, right? So one such subsequence uh, converges at x1. We, we know that, right? And then all the subsequences of that one such subsequence already exist, right? One of them. Just uh, whatever, which, whichever one we, we have here, just, just magically is here in the second row, one of them. It, it exists. All of them, the totality of them exists, right? So, so somehow this, uh, this uh, matrix has to be uh, uh, just not generated, just it's there. Can you, can you use like a mathematical induction? No, this? no. Well, you, mathematical induction never gives you the result. It, it, it's at infinity, at infinite time, right? Then, then you have to. And by the way, inductions they they uh, they fail when you when you go to infinity. So, for example, you might have you might want to prove by induction some property of uh, of of uh, finite dimensional vector spaces. So, for for example, that uh, that any function continues from a, a norm vector space, finite dimensional norm vector space. Um, What should I say? Let's say, if, 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 let me write it if you want to. Here. So you can have the statement, which by the way, you don't need to prove inductively, but uh, if V is finite dimensional normed vector space and dim v is n. And then what we have is uh, any function f from v to r is of the form f1, f2, actually Sorry, from, from R, let's better say, from R to V. This is going to be of the form F1, F2, Fn. 
right? So you have this uh, statement that uh, this is, co is continuous uh, if and only if each component function is continuous. So suppose you had that. Uh, then let's say you, you proved it inductively, though you, I, I mean the argument I'll give is not inductive. But suppose you prove it inductively, right? So you prove it for in the end. So is it true for, a fi for an infinite dimensional space? And the answer is no, right? It's no longer a true statement for an infinite dimensional space. So in induction means that uh, for no finite uh, dimension is it going to be violated. But once you have infinity, it's, you, you never, you, by induction, you never arrive there. All right. Just out of curiosity, why infinity is not true anymore? Why at infinity it's not true? You have examples that show that it's not true. Right? Yeah. Where, well, what would happen is that uh, if all the, uh, those functions might be each continuous, but the total function is not. So what, we, what will still remain true is that if the function is continuous, the component functions are, but not, not, the, other. not the other way around, right? So you, you might have a function that has all continuous uh, component functions, but it itself is not continuous. Right, you're still alive, guys? Yeah, if you want to think of an example where that happens, right? Lemma. So let D be a um, subset of a b with a belonging to d and b equal to the supremum of d. If f from d to r is increasing, then f extends to an increasing function. on all of A, B. Proof, can you, can you see this? How, 
how would you extend? There is a natural way to do that. So the function is, is increasing, you just connect the dots. Right, so uh, over A, B, we just have a bunch of dots, and uh, the function is increasing. So what you do is connect the dots. And the way to do it is you define g of x to be supremum <coughs> of f of y, where y is less than or equal to x, and where y is an element of d. Then, clearly, g of x is equal to f of x, or g uh, uh, on if x is in d. Do you see that, right? Because uh, we have less than or equal to, you just pick that point, right? And, and the function f, it has to be increasing. Otherwise, that would not work. Now, if x is smaller than z, g of x which is equal to supremum f y y less than or equal to x y in d is less than or equal to supremum y less than or equal to z y in d which is g of z. You see why this, this supremum is bigger? Uh, we have more range, right? We, we, supremum ranges over all points up to z, so over more points, therefore supremum is bigger. Bigger set, bigger supremum. That's really why. Make sense? So the proof is complete for this lemma. And uh, the next one is a bit torturous. If Fn is a sequence of increasing functions, on AB such that they are uniformly bounded. Then some subsequence of Fn converges pointwise to an increasing function. F on a, B and of course we have that the magnitude of F 
is also less than or equal to k. Should I use this board at all? No? All right. Proof. So let D equal to Q intersection A B and just in case union A. We want A to be there in D. Then D is countable. <coughs> By Halley's selection principle, there is a subsequence f n sub k of f n such that f n k of x converges to phi of x if x is in D. So in other words, we, we are saying that phi is a function from D to R. Right, so what we have is, uh, we, we have simply just a, a, a uniformly bounded sequence. If it's uniformly bounded, it has uh, some subsequence that converges on, on, on uh, the dense, so not dense, doesn't have to be dense, on, on the countable set that we picked. So we picked, in fact, we picked a dense set, right? So, What can we say about uh, about this uh, function phi? So notice that phi is increasing. Why is phi increasing? Well, if I have x smaller than y, and they are all elements of D, we have that limit, so we have that phi of x is equal to limit as k goes to infinity f n sub k of x. Now, the uh, functions fn's, the, or the, the functions in the family are all increasing, right? Therefore, this is less than or equal to the limit, limits preserve order. Which is phi of y. So increasing means that if I uh, fix n, I see that uh, this is just a family of all functions whose graphs are growing upwards. That's all right. I don't know how they are related. So if, for, if, if I have f2 and f1, I don't know how they are related to each other. All I know is that the graphs of one and the other are climbing up. 
as I move over AB, right? But it could be that F2 is bigger than F1, it could be that it's smaller exactly than F1, it could be that they intersect, but each, each graph is increasing. That's all I know. So here, I'm using the fact that limits uh, preserve order. Now, because we have an increasing function, we can now connect the dots. We can extend this function to a function of a, b. So extend. phi to phi a function on a b into r. Then By the way, how do you pronounce this letter so that I'm not mispronouncing it? You don't know what it is? Maybe it's uh, really the, the same letter written differently, right? But uh, uh, so let's call it phi again, right? It, it's definitely a Russian letter, phi, right? So it's, it's so. Well, I mean, in <laughs> Greek and Russian they have similar letters, but in Russian that's how you write uh, the sound uh, f, right? So I'll call it fair. So then fair is also increasing. Now we no longer know uh, what happens at other points, right? We know that uh, uh, that it's, it, 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 we know only that phi uh, or fair restricted to d is equal to phi, right? So the limit is the same, which means that limit as k goes to infinity of fair, uh, of, sorry, of of f n sub k of x is going to be equal to phi x, which is phi of x if x belongs to d. But what happens outside of d? Could you just say one more time why phi is also increasing? Um, did I have this reason? It's, it's this. How do you connect the dots? Um, is uh, you take the supremum. Right? So when you have an increasing function, you just uh, use the supremum to kind of uh, ha connect the, the dots. But what happens at points x that don't belong to d? Right? We don't have, you see what we want to construct? Uh, this, this lemma tells us that we should be able to find a subsequence uh, that converges pointwise to a function on all the points AB. We only found a function that converges on some countable subset of AB. I don't know what happens at other points. Is it, is it defined in the proof of that one model? Um, what do you mean? Uh, it's also you constructed the, the function, right? I constructed the function on, uh, on a subset, right? So I used Haley's principle to uh, construct the function, uh, first go the function phi on D, and then I extend this function over the whole interval, and I call this function uh, fair. Yeah, so is it like a step function? Uh, I don't know how it looks like. Uh, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't have to be a step function, doesn't have to be continuous. Because uh, all we know is that this is a sequence of increasing functions. Okay. Right? But we do know something about uh, the discontinuities. I mean, they cannot be too many. Because the function is increasing, so could, could have only account to be many discontinuities. So you see uh, two steps. First step is that out of the, all those functions, they're just, they're just uh, bounded. We don't know anything about them except that uh, their graphs are, are squished in, let's say, maybe in the size of this border. Uh, right? So uh, there are many graphs that are, that are going upward. 
So maybe a graph like this going upward, another graph like this going upward. So many, many graphs that, uh, that only go upward. And they are restricted inside of this board. So somehow uh, among those graphs, I see that, uh, that uh, if I just delete a bunch of them, just pick a subsequence of graphs, it's, it, they start looking like they converge to a particular graph. And they, co they converge to a particular graph, which will be, we're, we're going to try to find what it is. Right? So first, uh, formally what we have is we have this subsequence that converges at the dense set. That creates this function phi uh, on d. And then we extend this function to encapsulate the entire interval, right? So what happens at points uh, that are not in D? So so here is uh, claim A. If If phi is continuous at x, and it's going to be continuous at most x, you agree? If it's continuous at x, then phi of x or f of x is equal to limit as k goes to infinity f n sub k of x. So you see that I am no longer using x and d. It's just uh, a, some point of continuity of this function. And why is that the case? Well, what we do is you let x be bounded by two rational numbers. So here we have P and Q are in the set D. And we select them such that phi of Q minus phi of P is less than epsilon over 2. That's by continuity, right? So if I select P very close to X, then uh, uh, Phi of p and phi of x are close, and phi of x and, and uh, phi of q are close. So therefore, I can select them so close that uh, the distance between uh, phi of q and phi of p is less than epsilon over 2. You see how we use continuity here, right? So each of those points, this one is drawn from the right, this one is drawn from the left. And therefore, uh, phi of b being an increasing function, this is drawn from the right, this is drawn from the left, uh, and phi of x is between them. Here's the drawing. Q, x, sorry, p, P, X, Q, that will be P of P, P of X, and P of Q. Now, uh, take K big enough such that, or PK1 big enough such that F and K of P is going to be in the interval phi of p minus epsilon over 2, p of p plus epsilon over 2, 
Clearly, this can be, uh, be done, right? Because at the point P, there is convergence. The point P is an element of D. So there is convergence, so therefore, uh, if, if K is big enough, this looks like P of P. And simultaneously, I just uh, uh, require that P and K of Q is in the interval P of Q minus epsilon over 2, P of Q plus epsilon over 2. So then we have F and K of X. I want to know where that goes, right? X is this number to which I'm not certain there is convergence. So f and k of x, well, it's going to be less than or equal to f and k of q because this function is increasing. And this element, fn of q, is less than this upper bound. So this is less than P of Q plus epsilon over 2. And this yet is less than phi of Q. Where is phi of Q? Phi of Q is less than phi of P plus epsilon over 2. So this is less than P of P plus epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 or plus epsilon. Similarly, if I begin with f and k of x, so you see I want to, sh to, uh, to shove it in the interval very close to, oh yes, and, and, and this is less than or equal by, by, uh, by growth than phi of x plus epsilon. Basically, what I want to put this thing is between uh, phi of x plus epsilon and phi of x minus epsilon. That's the idea. So now I want to find the lower bound, so it's not too uh, far below. So uh, phi n of x is bigger than or equal than phi n k of p. which is bigger than phi of p minus epsilon over 2 by this condition, which is bigger than phi of q minus epsilon that's, uh, 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 that's because if I just rearrange this equality, I move the phi of p here, and I subtract epsilon over 2. So we have epsilon over 2 subtracted, and yet another epsilon over 2 subtracted, so we have this. And phi of q is bigger than uh, phi of p, or actually x, I don't really need to go there, right? Phi of x minus epsilon. And together, if I take 1 and I take 2, I hope you're not dying, guys. <laughs> So uh, what we have is, uh, we, we therefore have limit as k goes to infinity of f and k of x is p of x, right? So we, we showed that wherever it's continuous, we extended it uh, to quite a lot of points, right? We had a countable set. 
Now there must be an uncountable set of places where it's continuous. So we, we have extended it to everything except maybe now there is a possibility that uh, x is in the is one of those uh, countable points where the function is not continuous. So suppose that x belongs to the set of discontinuities of phi. Right? So what happens then, uh, what we can do is, it's a countable set, again by, since, since this is monotone, the f set of discontinuities is countable. which implies by Halley's principle we can select uh, a further subsequence. F N K R of F N K such that F N K of R restricted to the set of discontinuities converges. So the implication is that the sequence F N K of R of X will converge to f of x as r goes to infinity. You see what I did? Now, what is this f of x? Uh, if x is an element of uh, um, the complement of the discontinuities of phi, then f of x is the same as this function. Right? So we just pretty much uh, had convergence for every place where it's continuous, and then we found another subsequence to make it converge, uh, converge everywhere. Right? Let me just uh, state Halley's theorem. I don't think we have time to prove it. Right. If x is not uh, in the complement, but just in the discontinuity set. So if it's uh, not in the discontinuity set, you mean? Just like one line above. So what's the f x over there then? Uh, if it's uh, well, in f f x, if it's not in the set of discontinuities. Or if, if it's, it's ah well, that's a new function. That's why it's f. It's a new function, right? We we, we did not know what uh, this uh, fair is uh, for functions or for elements x where continuity was not assured. So we now selected another function and uh, and and modified the limit. Right. Okay, so so the fair function is like a piecewise function on the two terms. Uh, Piecewise, I, I, I don't uh, I don't know how it uh, how, what it is really at, at all. all right? uh, it, it just it just really probably it's very similar or probably graphically indistinguishable from this. That's certain because uh, um, yeah, it would graphically be indistinguishable I think from from this uh, from this function. I mean, like eventually you say the sequence, uh, the subsequence will converge to some function. So the function has two kind of like a domain. One is simple to the phi, uh, phi, phi x and the other is x. I suppose maybe here is how you can imagine it, right? Imagine you have, um, so basically you, you, you have some, some sort of uh, graphs, right? Each of them are increasing. 
uh, you don't know in, in which order you forget which is f1, which is f2, et cetera, right? So, so you have this arrangement of, arrangement of graphs, and then uh, what this construction is, is doing, it, it now, you, you see that they are all clustering somewhere near a graph, and then on this graph there are some points that are kind of oscillating. You don't quite, they are not quite determined, right? So then you create some, uh, uh, some, some further subsequence of graphs so that at those isolated points it also converges. Right? In other words, maybe, maybe uh, so what, you're, what you will see is you will see that we have, let's say, a graph like this, and here are, let's say, are a few points of discontinuity, right? And for those points of discontinuity, you, you have a few, uh, a few choices. You have a choice uh, of being here or here, maybe a few choices like this. I mean, it has to be an increasing function, so I suppose something like this, better, right? So you have a, uh, you have a few uh, choices of, of points. So maybe the point is is here. Maybe it's here. Maybe the point is here. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's here. Right? Again, again, the, the way I drew it, I guess maybe it has to be because it has to be increasing. So. So they're just an uh, uncountable uh, subset. There are points that are still not determined. So what you do is you pick the, uh, just one of those points that might fit. Maybe a better picture would be, one second before we go. Maybe a better picture is uh, something like this. And maybe you have a choice of uh, either this point or that point, either this point or that point, and maybe some points in between. You might have some points in between. That's roughly what's happening. Right? But if you're constructing it mm, the way we did earlier by taking the soup, does mm -hmm. that just mean that it stays at that that value say there? Yeah, yes. That, that, it, that it just you're, stays you're there. You're right. You're right. Then, you're right. So so let's suppose that they are. Should they say that that? Yeah. If you, by, by the soup, it, it picks it picks the bigger values. The bigger values. So it jumps up at that wave. No, it takes the soup of all values less in D. Mm -hmm. So if these are the values in D and mm -hmm. we're you know, calculating the value of X in there, it's the soup of everything less than it, which means it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean exactly it's a little it's a little puzzling. It could be it could be that uh, really the function is is already determined and, and you just um, how do you say it? You cannot prove that it's determined, right? We were using continuity here, perhaps uh, this is already the function. We just uh, perhaps the set of, of uh, points where, well, it doesn't have to be continuous, but but uh, perhaps we already have convergence everywhere, right? But we don't, don't we don't know how to prove it. You see, so perhaps uh, already at uh, at the step where we constructed this uh, function, fair, we already have convergence everywhere. We definitely we verify that we have convergence where it's continuous, but. Uh, we don't know how to verify that there is convergence at places where it's not continuous. And it might have places where it's not continuous. So then you use Haley's argument to say select a subsequence, but really, uh, uh, pretty much as you pointed out, it could be already that, uh, I need to think about it, it could be that this function is already determined. So convergence already happens. So there is no difference. This f is not different at all from fair. Right? But I, but I don't know. We can think about it, see if you, if you see it better. Anyhow, all right, have a good weekend. <laughs>